Hello, and welcome to today's special event, Why Companies Fail with Salesforce Innovation and How to Avoid It, brought to you by Spiceworks of Davis and Spinnaker Support. I am KJ Bannon. I'll be your moderator for today. We have just a few quick notes before we begin. Slides will advance automatically throughout the event. In addition, the console you're looking at is customizable. This means you can move and resize any of the windows you see open, as well as explore the widgets, which you'll find right there in the middle of your screen. For instance, check out the Handouts widget, which is the fifth from the left. We'd like the event to be as interactive as possible, so at this time we invite you to ask any questions you may have using that question button right in the middle of the widgets menu. We'll get to as many of your questions as we can towards the end of the event. We also have an attendee chat session where, where you can interact with other webinar attendees. Please use that chat to start a conversation with your fellow IT professionals or chime in on one that's already in progress. But please note that we always follow our community guidelines and chat to keep things fun, respectful, and professional. And finally, an on-demand presentation will be available after our event, and you will receive a link via email. We also invite you to stick around towards the very end of the event where we will announce the winner of our prize today, a Pioneer 3D NAND external SSD. So the need for experienced, capable Salesforce experts is growing exponentially. One study by IDC Research found that what it calls the Salesforce economy would create more than $1 trillion in new business revenues and 4.2 million jobs between 2019 and 2024. This huge increase in open positions means finding the right person to work on your company's Salesforce iteration might be a little challenging right now. So that's why our experts today will discuss how you can find the right Salesforce support options for your company and maintain continuous Salesforce innovation to propel business revenue. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our experts, Dagan Gray and Chad Stewart. Dagan is a Salesforce functional architect at Spinnaker Support. He has more than a dozen experience, years of experience working across the Salesforce ecosystem. Chad is, <coughs> excuse me, Chad is the Vice President of Global Salesforce and SaaS Support Services at Spinnaker Support. In his role, he is responsible for all SaaS business development activities, consulting delivery, and organizational development. And with that, let's get started. Chad, I'd like to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, KJ. All right, good morning or good afternoon, depending on uh, where, you're, where you're sitting, and welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, and joining us today. I think we have some excellent ideas uh, and content to share with you all, and I think I speak for everybody here when we look forward to your questions, comments, and, and really participation. So, all right, without further ado, let's take a quick look at the agenda. So we'll do uh, just some brief introductions, uh, myself and uh, and Dagan, we'll touch you know, a little bit about our history in the Salesforce ecosystem, uh, tell you a little bit about who Spinnaker is just very briefly, and then we'll jump right into the heart of the conversation, talk about why do companies fail at Salesforce innovation? What does that, what does that ecosystem look like? Uh, we'll talk about what the Salesforce support options are that are out in the market today, and what does it look like to achieve continuous innovation, right? Let's not just talk about uh, how it's hard to do, let's talk about what it looks like to do that, and then look at some success stories as well before we conclude with the uh, conclusions, of course, <laughs> and move over to the Q&A. All right, so again, I'm Chad Stewart. Uh, thanks for taking the time again today. I've been in the Salesforce space for over 10 years, really started started out doing a lot of configuration and development, and then as my career progressed uh, to doing architecture and delivering large-scale program implementations uh, with the big four consulting firms, uh, moved into practice development. And through that time, I've been thinking a lot about this problem, so I'm really excited to share these ideas uh, with you today. And I'm joined today by Dagan Gray, my colleague. Uh, Dagan, you mind introducing yourself? Yes, hi everyone. Um... Dagan Gray, I'm a Salesforce functional architect. Uh, I've been working in the ecosystem for over 12 years, both on the product side and the consulting side. Um, like Chad, I, I find this concept fascinating and very important. And so I'm, I'm eager to share it with you today. Awesome, thank you. Well, perfect. Well, you might be asking yourself, hey, who is Spinnaker, right? Um, but just really quickly, Spinnaker Support is a leading global provider of on-premise and cloud-based enterprise software support services. And what does that mean? That means for mid-sized to public sector Fortune 100 companies that run Oracle, SAP, or leverage Salesforce as part of their enterprise architecture picture, we help them support those systems. Uh, great reputation over the life of our company, 
And from a breadth perspective, you know, we've been around since 2008, operate in over 100 or support customers in over 104 countries and have 11 locations worldwide. So just a little bit about who we are. All right, let's get into the fun stuff here. Okay, so in my time supporting companies and achieving the maximum return on investment from their Salesforce instance, I've seen a consistent problem. And maybe it's because I've been in the project implementation side of things for the longest, um, but with the world's most innovative CRM, what I see is that companies typically fail to plan for the ongoing innovation needs. And I'd like to paint the picture this way. Of Salesforce is a train, right? And it's rumbling down the tracks. Uh, and as it's moving forward, it's, it's pushing out new features through its three uh, annual releases. It's acquiring new companies and integrating those in. It's expanding not, not just sales and service and platform, but every single one of the clouds that it now has to offer. And when we all join on to that, right? Anytime your company implements Salesforce for the first time or adds a new cloud, ideally you're taking advantage of where that train is at that point in time, right? You're taking advantage of the newest feature set that's available. Um, but then from that moment forward, Salesforce doesn't stop, right? So why should you? And really the, the premium we all pay for Salesforce, uh, the assumption is that, hey, we're gonna get some value out of that continued innovation. But there's a lot of challenges in the market today that keep companies from taking advantage of that innovation. All right, so when you're on that Salesforce journey, here's the thing, hopefully these resonate with you as far as what you've seen, what you've experienced, uh, but I find them to be very common in uh, common challenges that folks encounter. So the first one, hey, after that first implementation or even the second or third cloud implementation, that implementation team, you know, typically those are done by a project team an outside consultancy comes in to help. They roll off and go to the next project and you're left to figure out, hey, how do you update that thing they built? How do you figure out why we built it a certain way? So on and so forth. Uh, staffing challenges, right? If you've ramped up internal staff to kind of take on this um, or you know, you brought in people, it's a very competitive staffing market and we all have folks coming and going, uh, which presents its own challenges. New business requirements, ideally, right? The business is changing. You're gonna face new strategic challenges or have new products to offer. All of these business changes need to be coupled and supported by technology changes. Seasonal releases, talked about, talked about that already, but there's three releases that push out a new set of functionality uh, each year, automatically applied, can you take advantage of it? Expanding complexity. The more you build up, uh, the more your staffing changes and new people come in and solve things in different ways, the more your system, your uh, your instance of Salesforce's complexity will expand. New implementations, talked about that. A great example I like to use is, hey, you can start with Service Cloud, or excuse me, Sales Cloud, and then say, well, we need to implement Service Cloud so that we have a better picture of our customers. That, you know, obviously brings in new, new aspects. And then from there, it's, well, maybe Field Service Lightning will help us deliver more value. Integration projects, uh, obviously all the data in one system doesn't make any sense. We all have complex enterprises where we need to share that data across to be able to make the right decisions at the right times. Adoption, that's a big one. Salesforce is an expensive product. Uh, the return on investment from that requires adoption from users and those users being very efficient, more efficient than they were in doing their what they're doing. And a lack of expertise kind of rounds it all out, right? Of, uh, even if you've got a great internal team, the Salesforce ecosystem expands at such a rate that it's very likely through no fault of their own that you're going to want to go after and need uh, to do something that your internal team doesn't have the knowledge around. So this is this is what that journey looks like. And I almost wish this slide was these as puffs of smoke coming out of my uh, theoretical train here, right? Of as that train's rolling down the track, these things are constantly happening and you're, you're gonna need to keep up with that pace of innovation. Otherwise it becomes extremely difficult to attain the ROI that you're looking for out of Salesforce. All right, and this is what we've, uh, uh, we've called or termed the Salesforce service void, right? Uh, you've got Salesforce chugging down the tracks with new innovation. You've got these other environmental and ecosystem challenges around staffing, uh, around other data needs, complexity, uh, et cetera. And how do you keep up with that? Well, let's take a look. All right, so the service void itself, what is that? So the service void is what we're calling the gap between the implementation services you get when you first kick up Salesforce or adopt a new cloud or roll things out to a new business unit, you know, think of those big projects that you do and the support you get from some, from Salesforce themselves. Right? This, that is the space between those projects where you need to be able to continually adopt and expand uh, and address those user needs. 
play. And the way that we think makes the most sense is if you can find that that pace of play, that that rate of innovation delivery that works best for your company, right? Where you're not uh, turning off the spigot completely because the project team has rolled off, but you also don't need to continue to put out new features as if you're still on a project mode. That doesn't make sense, you know, fiscally or, or otherwise. So let's take a, let's just dig a little bit deeper into this concept of the void. I think a visual always helps. Uh, so along the vertical axis you have, and I apologize for the eye chart here. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm sure everybody will get a copy of the deck, but you've got the customer support needs across the side, the Salesforce customer support needs. So from the bottom, think communities, forums, technical training. Uh, this is going to be the basic stuff you get from Salesforce just by having a license, right? If you have one of their more uh, premier support packages, think uh, Premier or Premier Plus, which they've rebranded to be Signature, you know, that will get you possibly some like a developer to look at 200 lines of code, things like that, right? Uh, then across the top are your implementation services. It says, hey, we, you know, we built our business case, we went live with Sales Cloud. We built our business case, we went live with Service Cloud. We built our business case, we went live with Field Service Lightning. But all through the middle here, this is what we call the Salesforce service void of, hey, Salesforce isn't in place to help you implement what their platform can do for your specific business. They're there to support the product. And those implementation providers are there to deliver a specific outcome during an intense project. But what do you do between that? What do you do between those events and how do you make sure that you can keep addressing your business's needs? So what does it look like? What does it feel like to be in that void? And I, I'd be curious to see if any of these resonate with people on the phone here today. Of uh, The first piece I'd see all the time is poor process, whether it's not having a process defined or not having the right people or the proper people to play the right roles in the process that it takes to deliver new features, right? How you understanding what the business wants, prioritizing, it, justifying it, uh, and then staffing out the delivery thereof, right? And then capturing the feedback from that and doing it again, that, that constant cycle. Knowledge gaps. A lot of times we've got great internal teams. Maybe they're upskilling from you know supporting Siebel in the past and now Salesforce today, uh, but people don't know what they don't know. Resource constraints. Where we do see successful teams internally, it's typically in places where there's a lot of Salesforce complexity. Maybe you've got five, six business units all on Salesforce. Well, guess what? They all want something. They all need something to help move their businesses forward. And if you, even if you have a great internal team, they can only focus on so much at one time and somebody's getting left in the dust. And then adoption. With all of these things stack up to if users are clamoring for something, feel like their feedback is not being heard, dealing with consistent, inefficient processes, they're going to use the system to the bare minimum and you're not going to get the value you'd expect out of it. Um, and a lot of times these things can even happen if you have a project going on because that project is going to be focused, the scope is going to be controlled, and everybody else who's on the platform is not getting the love that they need. All right, quick question. And uh, no need to throw in your answer, just keep the keep the item in your head here. But what do you think? Based on third party research, what percentage of organizations gave themselves top marks for adding new Salesforce features? So really looking at, okay, we you know, we've got this idea, this concept of the void and to vet it, we went out to some third party research. And we found that 8%, 8% of companies gave themselves, right? This wasn't us grading, man. This was them saying, hey, no, we're <laughs> only 8% of them felt they did a really good job at this. So 92% said, we do not do a very good job at this. I think it actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's it's a complex skill set, ever expanding. It's hard to know where to pick things up sometimes uh, and know how to take action. Okay. Well, that's that's the challenge, right? That's, that's the environment that we're in. That's why companies fall into this, uh, not really trap, but a bit of a pit. Right where it's it's hard to continue to move the needle forward, and without some rigorous process and understanding of the various challenges, um, it's easy to fall into. Well, let's take a look at what those support options are. But before we look at the support options, I'd like to just walk everybody through a brief exercise where we can help you kind of gauge where you're at, where your enterprise is at, um, in regards to its support needs. So as you go through each of these questions. And it won't be too many. It's only one slide, I promise. Um, keep track of how many you say yes to and in which categories. So basic support, right? Hey, can you? Uh, does your company fail to regularly improve its Salesforce environment? Uh, is your in-house Salesforce team understaffed or underskilled? Do you have a backlog that never seems to get done? More intermediate items. Do you have an, do you have ROI or adoption concerns? How about data quality, reporting concerns? 
Is your Salesforce environment full of tech debt, right? Outdated workflows, unused fields, things like that. Do you lack the customer 360 visibility that you set out to achieve, right? That, that kind of core of a lot of people's business case. Is that in place today and usable? And more advanced, how about, uh, do you have a roadmap in place? Do you, or do you lack a roadmap in place? I guess it's gonna be a yes. Uh, do, you, do you plan on launching any new clouds in the next couple of years? Any new integrations in the next couple of years? Any new business units in the next couple of years, right? So things are gonna be bigger rocks to move. Are you planning on doing any of those? So, so really what I'm trying to paint up is that depending on what type of support you need, there are different support players in the market. So uh, keep track of your yeses, hold those in your head for a second. And here's, here's kind of my opinion of the, of the results. Hey, if you said yes to zero to two of these, I think you're, you're in a good spot, right? My guess would be you've got a pretty darn effective internal team or you've got a partner that you've got a great relationship with and you're able to consistently move the needle forward. Yes to three to six, um, you're probably looking at hiring more staff. Uh, you've probably got some users, some adoption lags, and you want to do more, but you're unable to achieve those things. Uh, probably time to start looking at some partner options, right? And if, if you said yes to seven or more, hey, don't don't worry. We've all, uh, well, maybe we all haven't been there, but seen it before, and there is hope, as the slide says. Okay, so let's start looking at what are the options. And right now, aside from the internal teams, uh, so but beyond your own in-house capabilities, I think there's really four options in the market today. Uh, first one, most straightforward, is the Salesforce support. It's part of our licensing, or you can buy the upgraded support packages, uh, but it's out there, it's available for everybody, Q&A, it really provides good advice on how to use the product. Next one up is what I'd call traditional managed services, okay? And when I say traditional managed services, think uh, this is access to a pool of resources with varying skill sets who can tag in and tag out on a ticket to ticket basis. So these are you know, teams of people who are kind of waiting back, waiting for those tickets to come in so that they can uh, help you out. And then they pass around and find the right person. This is a great fit for basic low cost support, typically out of a delivery center somewhere um, that can really help you keep things where they are today. That's, that's my perspective. We'd have a conversation about it, uh, but I don't see these as really un, you know, bringing to bear people to understand your business challenges and how to move the needle and deliver that business outcome or think strategically with you. It's really more of kind of waiting back for you to bring something to them. We'll talk more about that in a second too. All right, next one is implementation providers, consultants, you know, project-based work. Uh, these you know, certainly have their place of, hey, if you need to implement uh, service cloud across eight global call centers, right? you're going to want to hire the specialists who have the experience in training and change management uh, in the platform and integrating that into your enterprise architecture to really get you across the line. That's the, that's the right tool for that type of job, right? But, but across these three options, what I think is really missing is an option that provides consistent innovation. And I think it comes in the form of this fourth option which is what I'm calling the Agile Delivery Framework for Continuous Innovation. And what this is, this is a blend of the implementation providers and consultants and the traditional managed service options. And what I mean by that is this is taking resources, uh, you know, people who have done the projects, uh, who've kind of been there, done that, but want to dig in and focus on a, a smaller number of accounts consistently and drive consistent innovation uh, at those accounts. And then coupling that with the concepts for managed services of, you know, shared resources and lower cost models. So let me, let me paint this picture a little bit of a different way and maybe it'll help to resonate too. Okay, so another way to think about the support that's out there today, vertical access, hey, what's focused on short-term, what's focused on long-term? And then across the horizontal, hey, what are you expected to mostly do yourself or are you gonna have to have a lot more input into versus where are you getting expertise where people can really help you think through the challenges, recommend uh, leading practices and so forth. So right off the bat, easiest one to throw up here is Salesforce support. Again, it really, of course it's long-term, comes, comes with the licensing, and it's really focused on enabling you to go and do for yourself, right? Since you ask a question about how do we do X, Y, and Z, they'll point you to the knowledge article. If you're running into an internal server code and send them in the code, they'll tell you what the error says so that you can go and take action. Uh, even at the more, more premium levels, they'll look at 200 lines of code for you and recommend what you can do to make it better, that kind of stuff, right? All right, next one we talked about, 
traditional managed services. So again, I put them kind of towards the middle, but still in that do-it-yourselfish range because this is mostly an uh, maybe order taking isn't the right way to say it, but it's kind of like that, right? Of opening a ticket, telling, being explicit about what's either not working and how to reproduce it, or exactly what you want to change, right? It's it's sending it into a pool of resources who aren't learning your business, uh, but are technically capable and can work out a solution for you. All right, next one up, our implementation providers. I think these have to sit on this short-term spectrum and sit, I think they would slide along that line, right? Of the expert that does it for you. I've seen great implementations where they partner with the internal team uh, to deliver the outcome and make sure that that training happens and the internal team comes along on that journey. And then I've also seen it where the internal team says, hey, we don't have time, we don't want nothing to do with this, go do it for us. Um, but either way, they're, they're cost intensive due to the resource intensiveness of and the nature of the projects and the change that they're impacting and the outcome that they're delivering. So I think that what's missing sits right up here. And again, I think this would actually uh, slide back and forth in this zone too, but be mostly on that expert side of, hey, set up for long term having a cost model that can get you those 18 player resources at capacity levels that are affordable and can implement innovate implement excuse me innovation at a rate that works for your business right this is also a great option that can partner with your internal team to say hey if you got an internal team that needs uh, need some help blocking and tackling across the backlog great use for this if you've got an internal team who's you know, better suited to do uh, partnering with the internal users and helping to kind of control the admin side of things and letting an uh, outside party kind of move the needle on more innovative things. Great fit for this too. But it's really that blend between traditional managed services and implementation uh, to create this agile delivery framework. Okay, so um, hopefully this is resonating. And next up, I'd like to just talk through a checklist, right? So if if I were sitting in a, a, a conversation with a client talking through, hey, what is it that you need? How are you managing your Salesforce environment? These are things that typically come up that can drive out the conversation to say, these are your support options out in the market today. Where, where's your vision? Where are you going? What are the tools you need to get the job done? What do you first starts off with, right? What do you have in house? What can you do with what you've already got? Uh, and my advice would be don't overestimate that because a lot of times internal projects uh, and teams get pulled in many directions and a consistent kind of drumbeat of innovation can get delayed very easily. Um, if you don't already have it, these next two items I think are great for if you have a product owner who sits over Salesforce uh, or if that's a number of different people that, to get together and really talk about, hey, what's our business strategy look like for the next few years and where do we need Salesforce as a technology platform to support that business strategy and vision. So what's that multi-year Salesforce roadmap look like across needs and wants? And what's the importance of each of those? And I'd actually add in here too, to, to justify each of those with the business case that goes behind it to really think through and make sure that the prioritization is stacking up for you. This will help drive out, hey, what are the big rocks that we have versus uh, you know the projects? When I say big rocks, I'm thinking projects versus what are the smaller things that we could get done on a continuous basis that would just help us move the needle and incrementally get us to that end outcome. All right, next up, understand the reality of the various support types. So again, once you can have an idea of what can we do in-house, what's our roadmap look like, how does that pan out across the next couple of years, you can look at what are the support options that we have and need, and then I'd recommend talking to some Salesforce professionals about, okay, if you're looking for continuous innovation, talk to some of those folks, projects, again, finding the right partners that can help support you along that journey. Okay, so what does it look like to achieve continuous innovation with Salesforce? Well, to kind of pull this back, right, the, when we think about the void, um, there's a mission here in my mind of continuous innovation is your way out of the void of you're not going to get stuck in, in between that, that rock and hard place or the support from Salesforce telling you how to go do something and not having the capacity internally to do it and not wanting to spin up an entire project team uh, or having the budget to justify a project team to get some smaller things done. So it's really looking at what's that rate of change that your users can absorb that's also cost effective for your enterprise, right? And I think this next piece, I haven't touched on it, but we'll touch on it more in just a second, is, okay, that's all great that you can say it's an agile delivery framework. What does that actually look like? Well, what I mean by that is take the principles of agile that we see all, nearly every player use in their projects, 
Uh, and the reason it works is it's great stakeholder engagement, it's consistent feedback, and it delivers iteratively, right? So you're getting constant business value out into production. And take those concepts and find a way to put them at a pace of play that works for your enterprise. Uh, excellent. And then just a few, you know, hey, keep these in mind as you think through it. Uh, resources are hard to find, consultants are expensive, and Salesforce support is mostly you need to do it. So it's, uh, you know, those are kind of just the, the table stakes, I would say. Well, here's an example of what I mean by using an agile, uh, an agile approach, right? So for all of us that have done projects or are familiar with what that looks like, think of a sprint, right? How do you get to the point of you're planning your sprint, you're executing it, you're delivering that demo, and ideally you're pushing things up to production. Well, when we think about, when I think about this agile delivery framework for continuous innovation, that's exactly how we would build it, okay, right? You're taking those A team players who have experience delivering those large scale projects, and then you're putting it into a model where they can share their capacity across multiple clients to keep the cost controlled, as well as continue to deliver meaningful business value. So what does that look like? You know, as an example of what a month could look like, this could be, hey, in the first week, planning, right? It's, it's sprint planning, backlog refinement, grooming, it's release planning, right? So you're not only looking at what can we get done, what's the solution need to look like, uh, confirming our capacity enables us to do it, planning out when do we need to refresh, when can we go to production, when do we want to align on testing, key dates, and then we always focus on end user communication, right? Uh, you'll hear me say over and over again, this is the drumbeat of innovation, right? Users should get used to, oh, cool. Yeah, we know there's new stuff coming out. What's it gonna be this month? Oh, sweet, that impacts my life. That doesn't impact my life, right? Uh, but letting them know is a step that's consistently missed in a lot of enterprises. Move into those middle couple of weeks. So this is building it out, just like your sprint, right? You get through the planning, you jump right into build, uh, deploying it, testing it, uh, and ending with a demo, of course, right? Showing the people who requested the innovation, requested the features, requirements, et cetera, exactly what was built out, confirming that it meets their needs, releasing it for testing, um, and then finally communicating back out to that same team. Say, hey, this is what we set out to do. This is what we were able to accomplish. And finally, moving into deployment. So setting up a good uh, window for, for the production release getting the items deployed out to production and uh, you know, coordinating the training with the business that they want to execute and sending out that final release, right? Maybe this is a post to chatter to say, hey, at these groups and those groups, here's the new features, here's the training documentation, uh, looking forward to your feedback, enjoy, something like that, right? But the concept is taking that, that same agile practice that we use in all of our uh, large scale projects and implementing it on a monthly basis. So spreading it out over time and then controlling the capacity of the resources. So we're not looking to boil the ocean. We're not looking to deploy so much that uh, users are confused or overwhelmed by what's, what's new and how much change there is, but it's at a rate that people can absorb and get used to. Okay, so we saw this before, right? Of this traditional service package from Salesforce at the bottom, the implementations and the service void. Well, this is exactly where we built our managed service packages to address. Um, and just to show those really quickly, what this is, is think about admin assistance package. Well, think about each of these packages uses the same frameworks. And the only thing that's changing are the resource capacities and skill sets, right? Admin assist, just like it sounds like, you're just looking for platform configuration, right? Pretty simple. Uh, pretty straightforward. Manage and develop, looking at more of how do we configure it, and I also have development needs to deliver the innovation that I want. Agile team delivery, hey, I've got so many business units chomping for so many different things that if I can share the cost of that team across those units and give each one a few features every month, you know, life is good and we've got that steady drumbeat going for a large group of people. Okay, so that's that's a lot of, uh, you know, how I think about this stuff and, uh, and the model and how it matches up. And we've covered off a lot, right? We've covered off what is the void, uh, the service void. Why do why is it so challenging to innovate on Salesforce? Well, that train is continuing to steam down the tracks. Okay, how do you keep up with it? How do you create your own train, right? That's gonna keep up with Salesforce and really not as much keeping up with Salesforce, but keeping up with your business. And as we've all seen in the past year and a half, uh, things change very rapidly. Different workflows need to be supported. New products are consistently being launched. Um, so I think it's a very important concept for people to think about on the Salesforce platform. But where have we seen this work? Um, so I'll share one example and I'll pass it off to Dagan to share a couple from his experience too. 
so the first one is from a fantastic customer of ours, Common Mission Systems, where they started. We started the conversations really around on the sales side, right? Needing to standardize processes across the various business units. Need to consolidate disparate systems and get the data all in one place. And really having this concept, which I think was really smart right from the beginning, uh, from the business leadership of we want to start small and spiral out. Um, and what, what I mean by that is really get a foothold in Salesforce and say, let's get people on and adopting a very simple workflow in Salesforce, knowing that we're going to want more, they're going to need more, and we're going to need to improve efficiency and spiral out with what we can do. And that's exactly what we've done. So it started with the implementation of Sales Cloud across their global enterprise and moved directly into our agile delivery managed services. And so what that looked like was we get out of the hyper care that follows the implementation and move right into the conversations around, okay, we got all this done. Here's the backlog that came out of that implementation. What's the highest priority items you want us to work on? Go work on those, deliver them into production, work on communicating those out to stakeholders. The next month, same thing. And this is a meaningful enough body of work that we can get uh, you know, good chunks of things done and across the line, but it's not so big that users are constantly dealing with the change and having to be retrained or anything like that. So uh, you can see the quote there, which I, I couldn't ask for a better quote uh, in my career, but really the, I think what the big takeaway for me was is it's a proactive approach to being to providing that long-term support that keeps people engaged with the same account, right? It's the same players who've been there since day one, who understand the business, <laughs> understand the needs and understand the roadmap and can help plan that. Well, that being said, I'd love to pass it off to Dagan uh, to talk about a couple examples from his past. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chad. Just, um, you know, I'm thinking about this customer and the things you had said really resonated with me. This was a customer who had several uh, Salesforce <clears throat> implementations in the past and really felt like they weren't getting anything out of Salesforce. And, you know, we looked at it and they were trying to manage their, their partners, right? It was a nonprofit that had a very deep partner uh, engagement profile. And so they wanted to, uh, they had an implementation, right? So it was a, so it was a short project and they wanted to get in, they wanted to manage their activities because <clears throat> these partners are moving towards a partnership and they have to do certain things. So they wanted to track those and they wanted to really kind of surface uh, knowledge transfer to the organization because it was a real big team process and really show everybody in the organization well, what was going on with that partner at any point in time or that, that prospective partner. And so um, we built that out there was some really kind of cool uh, automations that we built that that were very complex. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is then we finished the implementation um, and they had they had all these automated tra activities that were tracking their customers, their partners, their uh, movement towards partnership. But that's not really what they wanted. And if we had left at that point in time, I think it would have been just another scenario and they would have they would have kind of fallen off that train track, right? So to speak, to use the same metaphor. Um, what they were really trying to do was identify which partners were doing the kind of activities that would eventually make them convert into true partners. And so that process really led us to a new innovation, which is uh, building an algorithm around the activities, right? Not, not all activity is created equal. And so we built that algorithm that allowed them to score the partners and really see who was doing the kind of things within their organization, because they had to apply a lot of resources to these partners if they were gonna get them across the line. Eventually, we were able to uh, implement artificial intelligence where based on the activities of those partners or prospective partners, um, Salesforce was able to predict who was most likely to convert. And that nonprofit uh, with limited resources was able to apply those resources in the most efficient manner. And so what ended up happening is that they, uh, they saw an 80% reduction in the expense to convert a partner. Um, and so it was for them, 
the consistent innovation. Yes, we did an implementation. Yes, it met, met all their needs. But when they get to the end of the implementation, they're thinking about what's next because now they're excited about what's been built. And now the conversation can go into what's next. And <clears throat> the nice part about this model is that the experienced developer who built the first implementation is there to help them take the next step on their journey. So if you could switch this to the next. <clears throat> so this is one uh, I was working with an insurance company and they had multiple disparate uh, systems. And they wanted to be able to pull all that data about all their lines of business into one dashboard. So I was in there <clears throat> as a partner, but helping them automate this process of pulling the data into one place so they could get a 360 degree view of their customers and really understand what was going on uh, from a profit and loss perspective. Well, the data was great. Um, and when it was pulled together, we could see a few different things. And the first thing I noticed was that it was taking a very long time to, to issue a policy in a particular line of business. So we had that conversation about, well, what's, what's actually going on here? <clears throat> How much of a problem is this for your organization? And what can we do to, to improve that? And that led us to taking pieces of the process that they didn't even think could be done with Salesforce and really doing them very well. Really, we took their application, we built an underwriting engine, we built some integration to their home office systems. And at the end of the day, it they went from issuing a policy taking three weeks to issuing that policy in two and a half minutes. And that was a huge, huge improvement for their, for their customers, for themselves and for their costs. And so I think the, the, the part that I would leave that I, that I love, that I say, you know, why do companies fail? They fail because they don't have a consistent relationship with an innovative partner, not somebody who builds things for them, not someone to, you know, uh, add and remove users from their Salesforce platform, but someone who can see their needs understand how to use the system to drive real value for them. And, uh, and I think this is a, this is a great way to do it. Awesome. Thank you, Dick. All right. Well, Hey, let's, let's jump to some conclusions and then we'll hop into the Q and A. All right. So what are the key takeaways? You know, we've covered a lot of ground here, but, uh, I think it behooves everybody to look at the challenge that you're likely to experience across your Salesforce journey. So where are you at today? What's that roadmap look like? And what are the tools you need to be successful to move forward on that roadmap? Uh, how, how are you impacted by this Salesforce service void, this concept of you know, needing that consistent innovation to keep up with the innovation, to keep up with your business, the strategy they're in, as well as take advantage of the research and development and innovation that Salesforce puts out? What's your current pace of innovation internally, right? Does it need help? Is, it, is, it, is that train moving along well? What can your in-house team cover for you? Get all these on the board. Um, I highly recommend thinking about using that agile approach to think about how does that incorporate into the continuous innovation approach that you use to solve across not only your backlog but really delivering along, uh, delivering what's you know focus on business value. So not just moving uh, the button from here to there or changing a uh, page layout, unless you're looking at efficiency gains, but really thinking about what's gonna move the needle for the business and those being the things that rise to the top. All right, and, and across all of these, right, I hope the takeaway for folks is that there are a lot of different tools to use for different jobs in the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, and I think there's, there's a new one that we're calling this Agile Delivery Framework that focuses on continuous innovation uh, that I hope people find is pretty interesting uh, and can think about how they can adopt those things. All right, well, that being said, uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate everybody joining today. Uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Uh, but if you do have any questions after the fact, you know, obviously you can reach us here at inputspinnakersupport.com or our uh, generic call-in number there, or please connect with me uh, or Dagan on LinkedIn, um, and we'd be happy to start up the conversation. But anyway, with all that being said, I'll hand it back to KJ for some Q&A. Great, thanks so much. So as mentioned, it is time for our Q&A. So, Get over there to our widgets menu and click on the Q&A 
widget and send us some questions. And I've been watching so many questions coming in, so I have a feeling this is going to be a very lively discussion. Uh, So in the meantime, while we're waiting for additional questions to come in, why don't we just jump right in with some of these. Let's see. Uh, Okay, so why don't we start with this one. So so this gentleman wants to know, would you please explain, again, the differences between your support offerings and what you get from Salesforce? Uh, Sure, sure, sure. Uh, So Salesforce is for, there's three tiers of it. There's what everybody gets with their licensing. Let's just call that basic. And then there is what's called Premier. And then on top of that, there's an additional layer called Signature. And what Salesforce support is doing in general is supporting the product. Meaning if the product is broken and not doing what it's documented to uh, that it should do, they will help look into those issues and either advise you of, hey, yep, you're right, you've identified a bug, we've got a fix in the works and it's, it becomes a known issue, we'll let you know it gets fixed, or um, hey, you might not be using this right, check out this documentation, uh, it actually describes the way that you should be using the system. All right, that's kind of the very basic. You go up from there to Premiere, and Premiere is gonna give you, I forget if it's Premiere or Signature, but uh, we'll just talk about the highest. The highest level you can get will give you access to accelerators. So if you're a company who's looking to adopt uh, many of the various clouds out there. The accelerators can be a great way for your internal team once you purchase some of the licensing for that new cloud to get spun up really quickly on how to implement it. Again, it's them uh, kind of teaching you and then your team, the internal team, needing to go and implement it, right? That's kind of the consistent theme with what Salesforce provides is it's, it's advice, it's advisory, and it's for your team to take and then run with it. Uh, the difference between that and what, what we do in the continuous innovation front is we are very hands-on keyboards, right? We're, we're bringing to bear uh, very experienced resources who've kind of been there, done that, who have great business acumen, who can approve, uh, excuse me, who can understand what the business goal is that you're getting at, propose solutions, and then go and manage the delivery thereof. Hopefully that okay, answers. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, hopefully. And if it doesn't, please go ahead and just send us a follow-up. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is actually something that I addressed at the beginning with the stats, and I think, uh, but I'd love to hear your comments on this. Uh, this person says, why is it so hard to hire Salesforce talent? You know, I think the truth of it is it's, um, and I think you're right, the study you cited states it well of, I think it, it calls out for each admin position that's open out there today, there's approximately one person that could fill it, right? One qualified person. For every developer, I think the study states it's it's like a one to five, and for each architect, it's like one to 10, meaning there's one person for every 10 posts. So it's a growing space where the resource demands are ever increasing. Um, and on top of that, uh, you know, we're all looking for the people who don't only have the skill sets, but also fit the company cultures, the enterprise cultures that we've got, right? To find that person who's gonna really be a good long-term fit. Who can help us take us take us along that journey? So it's uh, it's extremely competitive. It's expensive, you know, prices of salaries and so forth of getting these folks, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's it at the most basic level. Okay, let's see. Uh, all right, we've got another one here. How about this? What's the fastest way to see meaningful improvement on Salesforce ROI? Yeah, um, oh, that's a good question. You know, I think it starts with a business and understanding where they're at, where the pain points are, and what's actually going to move the needle. All too often, people want to just jump in and say, you know, a, too broad of a question. What do you need? And then uh, if you're talking to somebody, depending on who you ask that to, you could get very different answers and to know which one is actually going to move the needle, right? To actually provide that return on investment versus just becoming busy work, so to speak. Um, so I think it's that really, you know, conversation with the business. Of what do you need? How can you back that up? How can you justify how that problem is presenting itself in your organization? How can you quantify what that looks like to say, okay, you're saying that, uh, you know, your text, uh, your text interface isn't isn't good enough that you got out in Salesforce and that you need something better. But help me understand a little bit more, right? Why is it inefficient? Um, and really driving down to get to that prioritized list. And I think it's the concept of like, okay, now you've got your identified items that you can tackle to move the needle for the business. If it's not enough to create a project out of it, it's, it's going to become more of a uh, churning cycle of innovation. How do you get into that? Um, and I think the the concepts presented here around agile and continuous innovation uh, are the best way to do it. Of really, how do you get a team that can take your business vision and put that, uh, bring the technology behind it to life? OK. 
Okay, so we've got a couple of similar questions coming in. Um, but I think that the gist of it is people are asking what the most exciting development in the Salesforce ecosystem is over the past year. Oh, good question. You know, um, hmm. That's a great question. You know, I'm really interested in seeing how the various acquisitions that they've made will actually come into play, uh, particularly the Tableau acquisition. I think we're starting to see more integration options come out of that. Uh, and then more recently, the Slack acquisition and the talk from the C-suite down of how they view that as really uh, beginning to be a, a foothold or a challenging point against you know something more like Teams where it's an inherent part of it. Um, but I think how Salesforce actually executes upon those visions, uh, a lot of times I'm sure we've all seen it where you know the executives, the marketing engine of Salesforce is even better than its sales engine, uh, can get pretty far out there and what this means and how awesome it's gonna be, but seeing how that actually comes to fruition uh, will be very interesting. I don't know, Dagan, if you've got any that you'd like to call out of kind of exciting innovations you're seeing in the Salesforce space. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I would uh, agree with what you're saying, but I would say I would add Omni, Omni Studio in there. Um, I think the they are taking another level past um, past uh, low code, and uh, they're taking some, they're making some really, really complex um, <clears throat> automations declarative, and so I think. I think that's a big piece. I'd, I'd also like to say, you know, the one this is part of the problem and why it's so hard to find uh, qualified uh, Salesforce folks because it's a constant learning curve. So not only do you have to be experienced, not only do you have to be knowledgeable, but you have to be willing to to spend a lot of time learning all the time, and those people are hard to find. Okay, uh, let's see. So oh, they keep coming in. So let's see. Um, all right. So this is actually a good one. So somebody would like to know, how do you figure out when's the right time to work with a managed service provider? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a matter of looking at your, your backlog or excuse me, your Salesforce roadmap, understanding what are the next things you've got coming up. And if you've got, uh, depending on your needs, if you're talking I'm going to assume that the question was around, hey, this, this new kind of blend of project and traditional managed services, the Agile delivery framework. Um, I think it's looking at it saying, hey, if you've got a backlog of things that you need to get done to move the business forward um, and you don't have the internal resources to do it, the, the, the time is now, right? Uh, the longer you wait, the more you're going to be losing out um, and not being able to take advantage of those features, not be able to support the business as they need. And that has its own costs and opportunity costs against it. Okay, another question here. What does customer 360 mean to you? That's a good question. So Salesforce pushes a lot, right? It's now become the customer 360 platform. Uh, to me, what that is, is, is thinking of things holistically and not just from one lens of a business unit. Meaning if, uh, if sales, even if you only have sales and implemented, sales cloud implemented, so providing the sales team the purview into what's happening on the service delivery side, on the support side, uh, on the marketing side, and really getting that full picture of how is your enterprise engaging with customers at all of the various touch points. And, and the intent is to really say, uh, hey, we can all work smarter and make better decisions on how we engage and how we approach things if we have the information to share across the enterprise. Um, and I think a lot of it is, it's, it's absolutely possible. It, it comes where I think the biggest challenge is, uh, it takes an investment to get there, right? It takes change in business processes to get there um, and for, for enterprises and organizations to be you know, open to and willing and have the strategic vision of what that means to their enterprise and what it's gonna look like once they achieve it uh, in order to get there. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay. So we actually have the opposite question here. What are the pros and cons to hiring more in-house staff? Hmm. I think the biggest uh, pros would be if you can hire and retain. The retain is also the challenge. Uh, hmm. The right people internally, then you're going to be in a fantastic place, right? That's kind of the ideal of, uh, or not the ideal, but you'd have people who know your solution long term, uh, who can stay and help to foster it and build in a consistent, strategic manner. Um, the challenges are, 
as soon as you've got somebody who either maybe you trade them up in Salesforce, um, or they become a high performer, become you know exceedingly good at getting certifications, uh, and essentially become a, a target for recruiters. Uh, I mean, I think my guess is a lot of people on this call are probably looking for Salesforce talent, have been looking for Salesforce talent, uh, or have found people, and then it's just not the right fit, right? Because it's it's such an incredibly competitive uh, ecosystem. And for it's definitely an employee's, uh, you know, market. Uh, they can really find the opportunity at the company that they fit best with, and that's where they're going to want to stay. Yeah, I think I think if I could echo that a little bit, um, you know, there have <clears throat> um, much to my chagrin when there at many of the customers that I've worked with, you know, you can see these Salesforce administrators uh, gain skills. Um, and then they leave the company, um, and you know, and and then the employ the deployment's over. But then they leave the company, and they're left without um, a resource. So I think it's a real challenge to to uh, to work with a, an administrator who who could probably um, is building skills that would make them, like uh, Chad said, very valuable in the market. So this actually, this question came in back when we were talking about um, sort of the what you get at, from Salesforce. Um, but we have a follow-up question here. Uh, this person says, "Would you explain again the various levels of Salesforce support?" Sure. Um, so, so the most base, I, I can't remember what they call it, but let's just call it basic. But if you have just general licensing, you'll get their base level support, which is included. You know, it's a SaaS product, so obviously they're. Uh, they're keeping the servers up and everything, but then what you'll additionally get are access to the communities uh, and various forums and training documentations out there, right? Self-help kind of stuff. Uh, you can, of course, open a ticket. So if you find a problem with the platform, like if uh, you're building something out, the documentation says it should do X and you built it that way and it does Y, uh, they'll look into that for you and either say, oh, hey, you've got something wrong here. So it's actually working as designed or yep, good. Nice work. You just found a bug. We'll create a known issue, uh, work through a fix, and then you can track those known issues. Uh, they, they publish fixes for them all the time. Um, so that's kind of the, your base level, right? Of you can get some incident management, but they're not gonna they're not gonna build things for you. They're not there to help you implement uh, new features. Then the next level up is what's called Premier support. Uh, and so Premier gives you, I can't remember all the details. There's actually a good uh, chart out on Salesforce if you look at their support options, but it gives you access to uh, I think it increases their SLAs, so they'll respond more quickly to you. Uh, and I think it actually gives you access to developer support, which isn't somebody who will actually code things for you. It's access to somebody who will look at up to 200 lines of code for you and help you optimize it or identify if you've got any problems uh, within that code. And then their top tier is what's called Signature. It used to be called Premier Plus, but now it's called Signature. Uh, and it, it gives you access to the Salesforce accelerators, which are pretty cool. If um, if your organization is looking to adopt and, and implement new clouds. So what, what the accelerators are for is say you've got sales and service and you're thinking about doing um, oh, field service lightning, right? As soon as you go buy some of those field service lightning licenses, you can use the accelerator to then have a two day engagement with a Salesforce expert who will guide your team on how to do the implementation, right? So it's not, again, it's not gonna do the implementation for you. It's intended to ramp up your resources really quickly so that they can do the implementation. Uh, they can be really effective. They're pretty cool, but just to set expectations, right? It's not, it's not like an easy button for an implementation. Uh, it also gives you access to, I think it's called admin assist. Um, which for my customers, you're going to get varying reviews, but the intent is that you can hand off basic admin tasks to somebody. In practice, the way I've, I've heard it from, from customers is that, hey, you've got to put so much detail into what the request is for that person to feel comfortable making a change and then deploying it into your production environment that more often than not, uh, the time spent explaining it could have just been spent doing it. So mixed mixed bag on, on feedback on, on that one, but it's another option that's out there. I just uh, dropped the Salesforce link in there with all their success plans and the overview. So if people are interested, they can go to the community chat and check it out. Um, so we're actually coming up to the top of the hour. Um, I would love to leave a couple of minutes for both of you to just leave us with some final thoughts. So why don't we just take one more question um, and then we'll let everyone get back to their day. 
Uh, let's see. So this, let's, why don't we do it with this one? How do I determine what the right level of continuous innovation is for my company? Hmm. Okay. Um, you know, I think that all comes back to what's, and people in their enterprise are going to know better than I would, but what's the, what's the right level of adoption, right? Are, are users able to absorb, you know, several new features every month, every week? Um, hey, you could totally rewrite the system tomorrow and everybody would be happy about it kind of stuff, right? Like, what's that internal pulse on the uh, ability to absorb change? Um, and then what does the backlog look like? You know, how well do you have to find what those strategic priorities are and what you would want to actually move forward on? Uh, the kind of the nexus of those two of saying, okay, we can probably be pretty happy getting this much done and we've got that much done to find for the next, you know, next period of time. Uh, then I think it's worth talking to a partner uh, to see what does it cost, right? And, and looking at, okay, do, do those three things marry up? The rate of change that we want to have, the amount of strategic work that we know we need to get done, knowing that that's going to change, right? I don't, nobody's going to have a picture perfect uh, example of what the next year looks like. But then also, hey, what does the cost look like to get to that state of steady innovation? Um, and then that's really where, where I think the people are the most successful and happy. If you're not trying to jam too much down, you're not you know, feeling like you're spending too much to get too much done, but then you're not doing so little that users aren't seeing any difference. Yeah, I would add. I would add that you, you users are going to make that. Uh, your users are going to tell you how fast that needs to go. Um, and I would say that typically, when you have consistent innovation within the organization, the pace of innovation picks up very quickly. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, so, gentlemen, would either of you like to leave us with some final thoughts? Sure. You know, I, I think my last thought would just be. Um, I hope this was valuable. I appreciate everybody's time joining, and I hope that uh, you know people are able to take these concepts and, and really think through and implement uh, a way to deliver more innovation back to their businesses. I agree. Okay. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Excellent presentation, gentlemen. I love our Q&A. Lots of great information in there as well. Um, to all of our listeners, I'd like to remind you to check out that handouts widget, which is located right below the video window, where you'll find some more information. Also, uh, check out that chat window right now to see the announcement of who wins our, the Pioneer 3D NAND external SSD drive. And I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us today for our special web event, Why Companies Fail with Salesforce Innovation and How to Avoid It. I am KJ Bannon, and on behalf of Dagan Gray, Chad Stewart, Spinnaker Support, and everyone at the Spiceworks, Sif Davis Family of Publications. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day.